Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation and by Dr. Jimmy Turner and by rosaryarmy.com. You're listening to episode 119 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about whether the Bible teaches that we live on a young earth. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. For many centuries, Jews and Christians have read the Bible and thought that the world is only a few thousand years old. But after the scientific revolution began, many began to suspect that it's far, far older, billions of years old. Today, many Jews and Christians believe that we live on an old earth and see no conflict with their faith. But there are still those who hold that we live on a young earth. Some offer critiques of the scientific arguments that it's old. What are we to make of this? What does the biblical and scientific evidence really say? And how is it being misread, and by whom? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, first we should say something about uh, how we came to pick this particular topic. Yeah, so if you are one of our patrons at a certain level, we give you the benefit of being able to pick a show topic. And this time we had two patrons who picked very similar topics. One of them was Joe Kolb, who wanted me to talk about radiometric dating, which is one of the ways that we, for example, date rocks to figure out how old they are. And Simon Michalik or Michalik, not entirely sure how to pronounce it, wanted us to do a series on whether we're living on a young earth specifically. So they're very interlocked questions, and I decided to combine them and do a series. And in fact, there's so much to say on this that we'll be doing a three-parter. This is our first three-part sequence in the history of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Today, we'll be giving background information on the topic of the age of the earth, and then we'll look at it from the faith perspective. Then in the next two episodes, we'll look at the matter from the reason perspective and what the science has to say, including about radiometric dating. All right. Uh, Jimmy, is there a personal connection to this topic for you? Well, obviously, as someone interested in both science and religion, I've been very interested in the history of the Earth and how it came to be. When I was five, I invented a basic form of the cosmological argument for God's existence. My parents had all of these time life books on scientific subjects. And one of my favorites was the volume on the universe, which had pictures of stars and planets and nebula that I loved looking at. In fact, I just recently ordered a cheap copy used just to revisit some of those childhood memories. I'll be interested to get it and and go through it. And oh, yeah, I remember that picture from when I was five. I'll also be interested to see how little we knew then (laughs) compared to what we know now. Right. But when I was five, I became aware uh, that a friend of mine had a father who was an atheist. And I asked, well, who does he think made the planets then? Because I knew God had made everything. And I had these pictures of the planets in my mind. So I said, well, who does he think made the planets if he doesn't believe in God? And she responded, he doesn't know which is a pretty good answer for a (laughs) five-year-old trying to stick up for her atheist father. Like a lot of kids, I also went through a really strong dinosaur phase because, as is obvious, dinosaurs are super awesome cool. Of course. In the (laughs) 1970s, Land of the Lost was uh, one of my all-time favorite shows, and I sometimes still watch it. The Slee Stacks! (laughs) Yes, yeah. When I became a committed Christian at age 20, I had to start working through these issues in a more systematic way. I explored the different Christian positions 
on the question and did a lot of sympathetic reading of people who advocated them. But one thing I've never gone in for is dumping on people who hold a different position. I've also arrived at a stage where, from a certain point of view, it's kind of like I really don't have a dog in this fight. What I mean is that I'm not emotionally invested in either a young Earth or an old Earth. Neither am I emotionally invested in the idea of biological evolution taking place or not taking place. Some people are very passionate about these questions. Some are passionate evolutionists who heap scorn on creationists. And some are passionate creationists who heap scorn on evolutionists. But I'm not one of those people, and I don't look down on people from either camp. They both contain good people who are sincerely convinced that the evidence supports their position. What matters to me is the evidence itself, and by that I mean both the evidence from the faith perspective and the reason perspective. It thus includes evidence from the sources of faith, such as the Bible, and it includes evidence from the natural sciences, whatever way. The evidence points on questions like how old is the Earth and did evolution happen. I'm fine with that. As we'll see, I do think the evidence definitely points in a particular direction, but I don't look down on people who hold a different viewpoint. And in fact, I make a point of defending them and making room for their position. So, Jimmy, I happen to know that you have a local connection to this story that's worth mentioning. What is that? Here in the San Diego area, there are a bunch of towns, and Catholic Answers is located on the border between two of them, El Cajon and Santee. For a long time, the area was the home of the most famous Young Earth institution, which was based in Santee. It's called the Institute for Creation Research, or ICR, and it was founded in 1972 by a man named Henry Morris, who was one of the major figures in creation science. In 1992, Morris founded the Creation and Earth History Museum as part of their efforts. Eventually, in 2007, ICR moved to Dallas, but the Creation Museum is still here. And for years, I would drive by it every week on my way to call square dances on Friday nights. I'd love to go there, but unfortunately, it's currently closed because of COVID. Another El Cajon institution is the Mother Goose Parade, which is a big event every year with lots of involvement from local groups and some big floats traveling in the parade. Several years ago, I was asked to do square dance calling on one of the floats. We had a bunch of dancers on the float, which had walls so they couldn't fall off. And I got on the front end of the float and bounced up and down while calling and singing as we drove along really slow at like five miles an hour. Another group that was participating in the Mother Goose Parade that year was connected with the Creation Museum, and they had a really creative approach. They had these dinosaur costumes of T-Rexes that were really awesome. Inside each costume was an adult, and they somehow inflated the costumes so they didn't just droop or cling to their bodies, so they had more dinosaur-like proportions. They had a squad of people in these T-Rex costumes, and they walked along the street in the parade, and kids would run up and get a hug from the dinosaurs, even though they were a little scary looking. (laughs) But it was awesome. The uh, Creation Museum folks were seeking to show that they're not afraid of science and that dinosaurs have a place in their worldview. And I thought, what a fun and creative way to try to get your viewpoint across. And I admire that. After the parade, I found a video, which we'll have a link to, of one family from the group. So you can see them walking in the parade wearing the T-Rex costumes. Uh, I also love a song by Buddy Davis called D is for Dinosaur that they used as part of the soundtrack to the video. The point of the song is that in the Bible, we sometimes read about dragons, and these are what we now call dinosaurs. And that's true. People all over the world have been finding the fossilized bones of dinosaurs all down through history. Even St. Augustine wrote about an enormous giant tooth that he saw. And people concluded, rightly in the past, that there once must have been these giant lizard monsters, and that's the basis of dragon folklore. In fact, we'll have a link to a book you can get about this by the historian Adrian Mayer uh, that talks about this. It's a really great book. But I want you to hear part of this song by Buddy Davis, which is just really cool. So here's a clip. Hey, D is for dinosaur, but it's a brand new word. 
Invented in 1841, it means terrible lizard. Spell D I N O S A U R. Sir Richard Owen thought it up. He's a dinosaur. Most fossils are found in rocks made of sand. We'll also have uh, links to where you can watch a video of the full song and purchase the MP3 download of the song, as well as a bunch of other creation theme songs by Buddy Davis. All right. That's awesome. So uh, how will we be proceeding today? Oh, yeah. By the way, also one other thing about the Buddy Davis song, there's a moment in there where they're doing these drum beats that sound to, I guess, mimic the footsteps of dinosaurs going by. Uh-huh. But to me, you can you can actually sing George of the Jungle <laughs> to part to part of that. <laughs> In terms of how, we, how we'll be proceeding today, since our patrons have asked us to look at issues like radiometric dating and the Young Earth hypos- Hypothesis, that's what our focus is going to be. This means we won't be going into related issues in detail, like evolution, for example. But, of course, we will be discussing that in future shows. Instead, we'll be focused specifically on the Young Earth Hypothesis and the question of whether techniques like radiometric dating and the evidence of the Bible support the Young Earth Hypothesis. We should begin, as always, by defining our terms. So what are the Young Earth Hypothesis and radiometric dating? The Young Earth Hypothesis is the easiest to explain. It's the claim that the Earth is only a few thousand years old. That doesn't mean the 6,000 years that you often hear, but it does mean something on that order of magnitude. Some people will propose, you know, maybe 10,000 years, and some are willing to stretch it further than that. An order of magnitude, by the way, is a factor of 10. So an order of magnitude beyond 10,000 years would be 100,000 years. And younger supporters, so far as I can determine, all think the universe is younger than 100,000 years. They wouldn't go, they may say, well, 6,000, 10,000, maybe even a little more, but not an order of magnitude bigger. This view also holds that the entire universe is basically the same age, so it's not billions of years old, which, you know, is the most common view in scientific circles. The idea of radiometric dating is a little trickier, but basically it's a set of techniques that are used to date objects. The radio in radiometric refers to radiation or radioactive isotopes, the atoms that emit radiation. Metric means measurement, and so radiometric dating involves dating or determining the ob- the age of things by measuring the amount of radioactive isotopes they contain. The most famous form of radiometric dating is carbon-14 or radiocarbon dating. How does carbon-14 dating work? Most carbon atoms on Earth are carbon-12. The 12 refers to the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of these carbon atoms. And carbon-12 is stable, so it's not radioactive. But some carbon atoms are a different isotope, which means they have a different number of neutrons. Carbon-14 atoms have a couple of extra neutrons, and carbon-14 is radioactive, so it's called radiocarbon. Over time, it will emit radiation and turn into nitrogen. To measure how quickly an isotope decays into something else, scientists use a measurement known as its half-life. That's the amount of time it will take half of the radioactive atoms to decay. In the case of carbon-14, its half-life is about 5,730 years, but we'll just round that off to 6,000 to keep it simple. So if you had 100 atoms of carbon-14, then after 6,000 years, there would only be 50 atoms left. The rest would have turned into nitrogen. After 12,000 years, there would only be 25 left. And after 18,000 years, there would only be 12 or 13 left on average. That means that if you know how many carbon-14 atoms a sample of material started with and how many there are now, you can figure out how long it's been that those atoms have been decaying and thus how old the material is. 
Now, unlike many radioactive isotopes, carbon-14 is something that gets continuously made in the Earth's atmosphere. You see, our atmosphere is made of mostly nitrogen, not oxygen. I mean, we need oxygen for our bodies, but most of it is really inert nitrogen. And what happens is cosmic rays come zooming in from outer space and smack into nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere. When that happens, they turn into carbon-14 atoms. And so our atmosphere is continually producing this isotope because it's continually being bombarded by cosmic rays. Then, in about 6,000 years, half of those atoms will have turned back into nitrogen, but it's constantly renewing in the atmosphere, and so there's a fairly stable supply of carbon-14. The creatures on Earth, whether they're plants or animals, breathe or eat this carbon-14. Their bodies see it, and the body doesn't care whether it's carbon-12 or carbon-14. The bodies just go, hey, delicious carbon, we can use that. And so they're constantly taking in carbon-14 mixed with their supply of delicious carbon-12. They then do that all through their lives, so they maintain a basically constant ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in their bodies. But when they die, they stop eating and breathing, which means they stop taking in new carbon-14. That means that the number of carbon-14 atoms in their bodies when they die is now frozen, and that supply won't be renewed and will start decaying. That lets clever scientists estimate how long it's been since a sample of plant or animal matter died, and voila, carbon-14 dating. What kind of limits do we encounter with this kind of dating? Well, like any scientific measurement, it can only be done to a certain degree of accuracy, and it can be thrown off by various factors, which we'll talk about. Carbon-14 dates are thus approximations, but since carbon-14 decays at a steady, stable rate, they're pretty accurate most of the time, and their accuracy has been verified a bunch of ways, like checking the amount of carbon-14 against the rings of really old trees or against really old Egyptian artifacts that we know the dates for. It's not that there are no issues with radiocarbon dating. There are questions about precisely how the scale scientists use should be calibrated, including in particular parts of the world. We'll be discussing that, for example, when we do a show on the date of the Exodus. And there can be problems with individual samples of material, but in the main, the system has proved to be quite reliable. The major limitation, or certainly one of the major limitations of carbon dating, is that it will only let you go so far back into the past. At some point, there will be so few carbon-14 atoms left in a sample that you can't get a reliable date. And if the sample's old enough, there may not be any detectable carbon-14 at all. As a result, radiocarbon dating has a maximum effective limit of about 60,000 years. If you want to date something older than 60,000 years, you're going to need to use another technique. And how do those techniques work? Well, they use similar principles, but based on different radioactive isotopes that have longer half-lives, lives sometimes not in the thousands of years, but tens of thousands or millions of years. For example, the element samarium decays into the element neodymium, giving us samarium-neodymium dating. Potassium decays into argon, giving us potassium-argon dating, or I'm leaving off some of the isotope numbers. It's technically potassium-40. Rubidium decays into strontium, giving us rubidium-strontium dating. Uranium decays into lead, giving us uranium-lead dating. And uranium also decays into thorium and helium, giving us uranium-thorium-helium dating. Uranium, thorium, helium dating helps solve an early problem about the age of the Earth. What can you tell us about that? As Sam Keen explains in his book, The Disappearing Spoon, Just as hot coffee cools down in a freezer, 19th century physicists knew that the Earth constantly loses heat to space, which is cold. By measuring the rate of lost heat and extrapolating backward to when every rock on Earth was molten, they could estimate the Earth's date of origin. The premier scientist of the 19th century, William Thompson, known as Lord Kelvin, spent decades on this problem, and in the late 1800s, 
announced that the Earth had been born 20 million years before. So that seemed to set an upper limit for the age of the Earth, or at least a livable Earth. If the Earth was older than 20 million years, its entire surface would have been molten before that, so nothing could have lived on it. But this was a problem because Darwin's theory of evolution required more than 20 million years for the life forms we see today to evolve. No doubt, people who favored a recent creation just a few thousand years ago were cheered by that. But others were puzzled because the idea that the Earth was no more than 20 million years old seemed to contradict evidence for biological evolution and also evidence from 19th century geology which suggested that the Earth was a lot older. This is something a lot of people don't realize. It, it's not like Darwin showed up and suddenly people got the idea the Earth was old. That idea had already been around, um, and so that was not new. But Lord Kelvin's model assumed that there was only a single thing affecting the temperature of Earth, that steady loss of heat into space. So... If there was some other undiscovered source generating heat in the Earth, that would affect the rate at which it cooled down over the ages. It thus could be older than 20 million years, potentially much older, if there were an undiscovered source generating heat that Lord Kelvin didn't take into account. So, enter the up-and-coming scientist Ernest Rutherford, who was from the wilds of New Zealand before he moved to stately old England, and he could be quite a character. Here's how Sam Keen describes him. Natural vigorousness led Rutherford to experimental science, for he wasn't exactly a clean fingernails guy. Having grown up hunting quail and digging potatoes on a family farm, he recalled feeling like, quote, an ass in lion skin, end quote, among the robed dons of Cambridge. He wore a walrus mustache, toted radioactive samples around in his pockets, and smoked cigars and pipes. He was given to blurting out both weird euphemisms, perhaps his devout Christian wife discouraged him from swearing, and also the bluest curses in the lab because he couldn't help himself from damning his equipment to hell when it didn't behave. Perhaps to make up for his cursing, he also sang, loudly and quite off-key, Onward Christian Soldiers as he marched around his dim lab. And one of the things Rutherford knew was that uranium, element 92, becomes thorium, element 90, by alpha decay. Alpha decay is when an isotope spits out an alpha particle, which is composed of two protons and two neutrons. The number of protons in an atom tells you what element it is. That's why uranium is element 92, because it has 92 protons. So you can see how uranium becomes thorium, because when it spits out an alpha particle, it loses two of its protons, transforming from element 92 into element 90. Now, the thing about alpha particles is that they are the same as the nucleus of a helium atom, which has two protons and two neutrons, so helium's element two. All an alpha particle needs to do is pick up a couple of electrons at the store, and it becomes a helium atom. Effectively, a uranium atom can decay into a thorium atom plus a helium atom. Now, one of the things about helium is that it's a noble gas. The noble gases are called that because they don't like to interact with common elements, just like historically, noble men don't like interacting with common men. And helium is the snootiest <laughs> of all the noble gases. It doesn't like making compounds with anything. So you shouldn't find it in rocks. First, there, because there's almost none of it in Earth's atmosphere, there are only five helium atoms per million atoms in the atmosphere. That means helium is only 0.0005% of the air around us. And when a rock was forming, any helium in the area would not have stuck to the other elements that went into the rock. Uh, the helium would have just floated off because it's snooty and noble and doesn't like bonding with things. 
That means that if you do find helium in a rock containing uranium and thorium, it likely got there because of alpha decay. If the rock contains or originally contained uranium, it slowly would have spit out alpha particles that became helium, and these would have built up over time. The more time goes by, the more helium atoms you'll find in the rock, and so the more there are, the older the rock is. And voila, you can do uranium-thorium-helium dating. Now, back to the story. Rutherford had thought about this process for a few years by 1904, when he was 33, and Kelvin was 80. By that age, despite all that Kelvin had contributed to science, his mind had fogged. Gone were the days when he could put forward exciting new theories, like the one that all the elements on the periodic table were, at their deepest levels, twisted knots of ether of different shapes. Most detrimentally to his science, Kelvin never could incorporate the unsettling, even frightening science of radioactivity into his worldview. In contrast, Rutherford realized that radioactivity in the Earth's crust would generate extra heat, which would bollocks the old man's theories about a simple heat loss into space. Excited to present his ideas, Rutherford arranged a lecture in Cambridge. But however dotty Kelvin got, he was still a force in scientific politics, and demolishing the old man's proudest calculation could in turn jeopardize Rutherford's career. Rutherford began the speech warily, but luckily, just after he started, Kelvin nodded off in the front row. Rutherford raced to get to his conclusions, but just as he began knocking the knees out from under Kelvin's work, the old man sat up, refreshed and bright. Trapped on stage, Rutherford suddenly remembered a throwaway line he'd read in Kelvin's work. It said, in typically couched scientific language, that Kelvin's calculations about the Earth's age were correct unless someone discovered extra sources of heat inside the Earth. Rutherford mentioned that qualification, pointed out that radioactivity might be that latent source, and with masterly spin ad-libbed that Kelvin had therefore predicted the discovery of radioactivity dozens of years earlier. What genius! The old man glanced around the audience, radiant. He thought that Rutherford was full of crap, but he wasn't about to disregard the compliment. Rutherford laid low until Kelvin died in 1907, then he soon proved the helium-uranium connection. And with no politics stopping him now, in fact, he became an eminent peer himself, and later ended up as scientific royalty too, with a box on the periodic table, element 104, Rutherfordium, the eventual Lord Rutherford got some primordial uranium rock, eluded the helium from microscopic bubbles inside, and determined that the Earth was at least 500 me million years old, 25 times greater than Kelvin's guess, and the first calculation correct to within a factor of 10. Within years, geologists with more experience finessing rocks took over for Rutherford and determined that the helium pockets proved the Earth to be at least 2 billion years old. This number was still 50% too low, but thanks to the tiny inert bubbles inside radioactive rocks, human beings at last began to face the astounding age of the cosmos. And so, now the scientists were getting numbers corresponding to what the other lines of evidence from biology and geology were suggesting, that the Earth was really, really old. Today, the standard estimate is that it's about 4.6 billion years old. But advocates of a young Earth have sought to counter this claim, including by casting doubt on the usefulness of radiometric dating. So that brings us to our theories, but before we get to those theories, I do want to take a moment to stop and thank our patrons. In addition to our patrons who suggested today's topic, I want to thank the patrons who, all of the patrons who make this show possible, including Philip D., Catherine R., Alexander J., and James K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And as we told you last week, we're trying to do our final push to get to the financial stability point for us. As of the most recent data that we have at the time of recording, we're within $500 a month of hitting that. We've made lots of progress, but we still need to get to that financial stability point, and we hope to do that by the end of September. 
If we do, we've got some really special Bible software that we're going to be able to give away to celebrate. The software has been donated by the Faith Life Corporation that makes the Verbum Catholic Bible software that I use basically every day. It's really good software. We have a number of different packages include to give away, including one that's worth $2,000. So once we hit the goal, hopefully at the end of September, we will do a random drawing from all of our patrons at that time. So everyone, whether you're an existing supporter or a new supporter, you'll have a shot at winning one of those Bible software packages. Dom, how many total packages do we have again? There are 16 total packages, which is great. Very generous. Yeah, that's that's quite a number of packages. So 16 shots at winning the different packages. I think the least expensive of them is worth like $300 yes. and they go all the way up to $2,000. It's really good Bible software. It is good for your own personal Bible study. It's also configured for devotional reading and studying the readings of the day and uh, the liturgical readings and things like that. So please help us get to that break-even goal, either by becoming a new patron or by increasing your monthly pledge. Just go to sqpn.com slash give. Once again, that's sqpn.com slash give and help us achieve that financial stability goal. And we will then be celebrating by giving away some awesome Bible software. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by Dr. Jimmy Turner, your guide to practical leadership at drjimmyturner.com. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. So, Jimmy, uh, it's we're time for to bring up our theories. So what theories are there about the Young Earth Hypothesis? Well, there are two basic theories, one of which is that it's true, the world is only a few thousand years old, and the other, that it's not true. We need to look at these two theories from both the perspectives of faith and reason, and we need to look at the faith perspective first. While we should be open to evidence from both perspectives, the results of science are always provisional. However, if God directly states something, then as the source of all truth, what he states is absolutely reliable. And if faced with an absolutely reliable conclusion compared to only a provisional conclusion, the absolutely reliable one takes precedence. So, if we could show from the faith perspective that God has revealed that the earth is only a few thousand years old, that would settle the matter and we could save ourselves a lot of work. We'll thus look at the evidence from the sources of faith first and then, if it turns out they're not conclusive, we'll look at the scientific evidence from the reason perspective. All right, then, what can we say about the Young Earth hypothesis from the faith perspective? This is the primary source of evidence that Young Earth supporters appeal to in favor of their view. There are some arguments of a scientific nature that they use to argue that the Earth couldn't be billions of years old. However, these tend not to be arguments that positively show it's between five and 10,000 years old, but rather attempts to refute arguments that it's much older. The major argument for it being only a few thousand years old is based on data from the sources of faith. There have been various attempts to calculate the age of the earth from the biblical data, but classically there have been three major proposals. First, there's the Jewish reckoning, which is used in the current Hebrew year system. This calculation was done by the Jewish scholar Moses Maimonides in the 1100s, so back in the Middle Ages, and by his reckoning, the work of creation began on October 6th in the year 3761 BC, as reckoned on the proleptic Julian calendar, which is slightly different from the modern Gregorian calendar. The Jewish calculation is based on numbers given in the Masoretic text, which is the addition of the Hebrew scriptures that was in use in the medieval Jewish community. So those were the scriptures they had available to them, and so those were the ones that Maimonides used. 
Second, there's the Byzantine reckoning, which is used in Eastern Orthodox circles. According to this calculation, creation occurred around 5509 BC, also on the proleptic Julian calendar. So that's 1740 years earlier than the Jewish reckoning. This calculation is based on numbers in the Septuagint, which is the Greek edition of the Old Testament that's used in Orthodox circles. And then third, there's the reckoning done by the Anglo-Irish Archbishop uh, James Usher, who published his findings in 1650. According to his calculation, creation occurred on the 22nd of October in the year 4004 BC, again on the proleptic Julian calendar. Like the Jewish reckoning, this one is based on numbers found in the Masoretic text. Of course, this 4004 date is the one we're most familiar with in the English-speaking world, and it was often printed in the margins in the King James Bible. In fact, growing up, my family had a Bible like that. And you can see it's kind of in the middle of the other two dates, with creation occurring about 1,505 years after the Byzantine date and 243 years before the Jewish date. How did the people who made these calculations come up with their proposed dates for creation? They used a multi-step process. The first step was to start with the year of whenever they were living. Then you need to calculate backwards using historical sources to get the dates of events that occurred in the Bible. This could include events like the reigns of Roman emperors for the New Testament, or the dates for kings like Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon or Alexander the Great of Macedonia for the Old Testament. Once you had dates for events in the Bible that you could peg against secular history, you can then use chronological information in the Bible to extend this back further. A key part of doing that is reckoning the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah, because that's how they uh, reckon dates back then. It was in terms of how long the current king had reigned. So you had to add up the dates for the different reigns of the kings to get an overall date for things. But that doesn't work before Israel got its first king, Saul. So before that, they had to use numbers connected with the judges and the patriarchs. Then they would add up the numbers found in the genealogies in the Old Testament, like the ones in Genesis that attribute really long ages to the earliest patriarchs. And eventually you get back to Adam and Eve. That lands you in Genesis 1, which depicts creation as occurring over the course of a single week. And so once you find the birthday of Adam, or the creation day of Adam to be precise, you just add a few extra days and you've got the date of creation. But there are a lot of issues to sort out in doing these calculations, which is why the numbers come out differently in the three major reckonings. Still, they all converge on the same general time frame, and they're definitely within an order of magnitude of each other, each indicating that the world was created between 7,500 years ago and 5,800 years ago, so about 6,000. I also have to say that these kinds of calculations are something I love doing. Biblical chronology is one of my big interests, and although I haven't published a lot on it yet, I've actually written a great deal about the subject, although I focused on the New Testament period, at least so far, in part because of some complications in doing Old Testament chronology. What kind of difficulties do chronologers encounter with the Old Testament? Apart from the usual ones that you face with any historical era, there are some special ones. For example, the numbers given in the genealogies are round numbers. Here's what Genesis 5 says about Adam. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years, and then he died. The way Maimonides or Usher or other people trying to calculate the beginning of the world use this information, they would take the date they already had for the birth of Adam's son, Seth, and then subtract 130 years from it to get the day Adam was created. But notice... The text is giving us numbers in whole years. It says Adam was 130 when he had Seth, 
not 130 years, 4 months, and 12 days. Yet, Seth probably wasn't born exactly on Adam's birthday, precisely 130 years to the day after he was created. And so the figure of 130 years probably involves rounding to get a whole number. That means that the text is approximating to a certain degree. It's omitting some precision when it comes to days and months. And that means it's going to be really hard to calculate the exact day of the creation of the world, which was October 6th on Maimonides' reckoning and October 22nd on Usher's reckoning. We really don't have the precision in the text needed to pin down the exact day of the year. What about the fact that the ages of the patriarchs in these early genealogies are incredibly long? That's another issue. Should we take these ages literally or not? Because they vastly exceed the human lifespan today. For example, Methuselah, the patriarch who lives the longest, which is why Methuselah is a proverb for someone who lives really long, is said to live for 969 years. Most biblical scholars today take these ages to be symbolic as a way of figuratively indicating the greatness of the patriarchs. And that appears to have been a common literary device in ancient Near Eastern cultures, depicting people from the distant past as having really long lifespans as a way of showing how great they were. There are also numerical patterns in the ages given in early Genesis that may be linked to astronomy, which could indicate that symbolism is being used in these ages. The most obvious example is that of the patriarch Enoch, who lived for 365 years, with 365 being the number of days in the solar year. The other patriarchs have ages that are suggestive of the motions of the other planets. However, at least that's what's argued. However, young earth creationists tend to be biblical literalists, and so they take these ages literally. If they take the ages literally, do they have qualms about using them to calculate the day or year of creation? Yeah, even though the precise dates given by Archbishop Usher have been very popular in English-speaking circles, especially in the past, they have fallen out of favor to an extent among young earth supporters. Some people still accept them, but others don't because they recognize they're not fully reliable. We've already mentioned one reason why, because the biblical genealogies give round figures that won't let you calculate exact dates. Thus, rather than October 22nd in 4004 BC, just the fact that the genealogies round off whole numbers of years could put the date of creation a few years before or after that. But there's an even bigger problem that could throw off the date further and potentially push it substantially into the past. That's because when you study biblical genealogies, you discover that they sometimes aren't complete. They skip generations. This may be due to the fact that in Hebrew, there are no words for things like grandfather or grandson, great-grandfather or great-grandson. There are only two terms, father and son. Any male who you are descended from is your father, no matter how many generations back he is. And any male who is descended from you is your son, no matter how many generations forward he is. That's why Jesus can be called the son of David, even though David lived a thousand years before Jesus, and there were many generations between them. It's also why Gabriel can tell Mary that God will give Jesus the throne of his father, David, and this can make it easy to skip generations when you're composing a genealogy. If you say so-and-so is the father of so-and-so, that will still be true, no matter how many generations were between them, because all father means is male ancestor of. And we can show that biblical genealogies do sometimes skip generations. A really obvious example is the case of the genealogy of Jesus that Matthew gives in chapter 1 of his gospel. This genealogy stretches from Abraham to Jesus, and it's patterned around three sets of 14 generations each. 
The reason for that may be because 14 is the number that David adds up to in Hebrew. The D is also the number 4, the V is the number 6, and the v second D is also a 4, so 4 plus 6 plus 4 is 14, and this could be Matthew's way of emphasizing Jesus' role as the son of David. But the three sets of 14 generations are not complete. Matthew has skipped some generations for the sake of this pattern, and you can see that if you compare his genealogy to the one in chapter 3 of Luke, or for that matter, some Old Testament genealogies. Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam, but if you count up the number of generations that Luke lists between Abraham and Jesus to make it correspond to the same time period as Matthew's genealogy, you'll find that there are significantly more generations in Luke than in Matthew. And if you pull in some of the Old Testament genealogies, you can identify exactly which people Matthew is skipping for the sake of his 3 times 14 pattern. Many young Earth supporters have taken the fact that the biblical genealogies can skip generations to heart and said, you know, you can use these genealogies to get back to around 4004 BC, but there could be omissions in them that we don't know about. And the real date of creation could be further back, depending on the number of generations that have been skipped. And if some of these people were living for hundreds or even close to a thousand years back then, that could push it back hundreds or close to a thousand years per skipped generation. That's why you hear some Young Earth supporters saying that the Earth might be 10,000 years old instead of 6,000. Uh, some are open to the idea of it going back even further. But there's obviously a limit to how far back you could go on this view. Obviously, even with skips in the listed generations, people couldn't be expected to maintain a family genealogy over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. So you hear dates in the six to 10,000 year range or perhaps somewhat further back, but not dates in the 100,000 or more year range. You mentioned that the final step, once we've gotten back to Adam, has been done is to add a few days for the week of creation since Adam was created on day six. Are there any potential problems at this stage? Yeah, because we again encounter the question of how the text should be understood and whether it allows room for a longer period of time. There are some interesting proposals in this regard, and we'll cover them in a future episode on the days of creation. But here I want to mention the one that I find most convincing, because there is evidence that the days of Genesis 1 are not meant to be taken literally. But before we get into that, I need to introduce one more concept, and to see it most clearly, we need to look at the New Testament for a moment. Uh, so what is it we need to be aware of? Today, we have a very time-centric culture, and we keep detailed records of when things happened, and we like accounts that are chronologically structured. However, even today, we sometimes organize information in other ways, like putting it in a topical order rather than a chronological one. For example, if you're reading a biography of, say, Abraham Lincoln, it might have early chapters dealing with his birth and childhood and later chapters dealing with his death and his legacy. But in the middle, you might find chapters dealing with particular aspects of his thought, like his views on constitutional law or slavery or black people or anything else. These topical chapters would then gather material on his views based on their topic, not necessarily when in his career he expressed these views. Well, ancient historical writers often did the same thing. They sometimes grouped material in topical rather than chronological order. This obviously happens, for example, in Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars. Thus, when he's talking about the Emperor Nero, he has a section listing the stuff that Nero did, which was good, or at least unobjectionable, and then he has a section on all the bad things Nero did. He even says things like, now that we've just seen the okay stuff Nero did, let's take a look at the bad stuff. So it's really clear he's organizing material by topic, whether it's good or bad, not by its chronological order. We see the same thing 
in the four Gospels, where we have multiple accounts of the same events from four perspectives, and we can compare how the different authors record them. For example, when you read Luke's Gospel, you find that he has a short ethical discourse of Jesus known as the Sermon on the Plain, but he also has individual teachings of Jesus on moral subjects scattered in other places. Similarly, you find in Luke that Jesus has a fairly short prophetic discourse he gives on the Mount of Olives, but you also have a bunch of other prophetic materials scattered in other places. That's not what you find in Matthew. In Matthew, there's one big moral discourse, the Sermon on the Mount, and one big prophetic discourse, the Olivet Discourse, or the Discourse from the Mount of Olives. It looks like Matthew took the moral teachings that are scattered here and there in Luke and combined them with the Sermon on the Plain and presented them in a section we call the Sermon on the Mount. It also looks like Matthew took the prophetic teachings scattered here and there in Luke, combined them with the short account of the speech on the Mount of Olives, and made one big prophetic discourse. The Sermon on the Mount and the Olivet Discourse are thus major sections in Matthew that are organized by topic, one on Jesus' teaching on morals and one on his prophetic teaching, just like you might have chapters in an Abraham Lincoln biography on different topics that he addressed. Another clear example of this topical organization occurs with the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. In Mark's gospel, first Jesus curses the fig tree, then he goes to Jerusalem and clears the temple, then they come back and see the fig tree withered. But in Matthew's gospel, first Jesus clears the temple, then he curses the fig tree, and then they see it withered. In both cases, we have the same events, but in a different order. Matthew has moved the two parts of the fig tree story next to each other because they're on the same topic, the cursing of the fig tree. And he wants to keep the material on that topic together, just like he prefers to keep Jesus's moral teachings together and Jesus's prophetic teachings together. All this means that we need to be attentive to the fact that the biblical authors sometimes organize material in a topical way rather than a chronological way. So how does this relate to the book of Genesis? Here's how the book opens. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. After we have the initial statement that God created the heavens and the earth, we have an initial description of the earth, that it was formless and void. Another way of saying that is it was formless and empty. So the created world has two initial problems. It's not yet formed, and it's also empty. Over the next six days, God will address both of those problems. Initially, on the first three days, he will give the world form so that it will no longer be formless. Then, on the second three days, he will populate the world with things so it will no longer be empty. Could this division into two sets of three days just be something that skeptical moderners came up with? No, it's been recognized for centuries. For example, in his Summa Theologiae, St. Thomas Aquinas refers to the work of the first three days as the work of distinction, because on these days God made distinctions between things to give the world form or structure. Aquinas then refers to the work of the second three days as the work of adornment, because on them God went back over the realms he had distinguished from each other and adorned them by populating them with things so they're no longer empty. Here's how the work of distinction played out. On day one, God creates light and distinguishes it from darkness, resulting in the day-night cycle and giving us the first day. On day two, God separates the waters above from the waters below, creating the sky and the sea. And on the third day, God causes the waters below to separate from each other, giving us dry land. And thus, now that the earth is fully formed, it's no longer formless, but it is still empty. And then how did God tackle that problem? 
by revisiting the same three realms in the same order and populating them. On day four, God revisits the day-night cycle and populates it by creating the sun to rule the day, the moon to rule the night, and also the stars. So now the day and the night are no longer void or empty. On day five, he revisits the sky and the sea, and he creates the birds and the fish. So now the sky and the sea are no longer empty. And on day six, he revisits the dry land and creates the land animals and man, so the land is no longer empty. The world is now both completely formed and completely filled. The formless and void problems have been solved, and so God finishes his work and rests on the seventh day. Or, as it said in a kind of avant-garde play about Genesis called Genesis that I once saw performed, on the seventh day, God kicked back. (laughs) Already, from what we've seen, it looks like we have material being arranged in a topical order. First, we have the work of distinction, which goes from top to bottom. First, visiting the day and the night, then the sky and the sea, and lastly, the land. And then second, we have the work of adornment, which also goes from top to bottom, with God first adorning the day and the night, then the sky and the sea, and finally, the land. Is this merely a topical order, or is it also chronological? The fact that we have days attached suggests, at least on the surface, that it's both topical and chronological. But we need to ask, could those days be a literary device, meaning that they're not literal, and the biblical author is simply giving us an account of the work of the Creator that's organized by topic rather than by time? Well, here's the twist. The ancients knew just as well as we do that it's light from the sun that causes it to be day. So, what is a careful ancient reader to make of the fact that the day-night cycle was created on day one, but the sun, which makes it daytime, wasn't created until day four? In light of that fact, pun intended, it's reasonable to take the days as a literary device. The attentive ancient reader would have realized that there there wouldn't be any literal days before the creation of the sun. There you know can't be a day night cycle with no sun. So that suggests that Genesis one is giving us a topical account of the work the creator did as a literary device that has been fitted into the framework of a Hebrew week. Weeks, seven-day weeks, were characteristic of Hebrew culture, but not other cultures. This is what's sometimes called the framework hypothesis, and the author signals his audience that he's not giving a literal chronology because of the fact the sun isn't created till day four. And by the way, you don't have to be a modern person to conclude that Genesis 1 is not giving us a chronological account. Various highly intelligent people in the ancient world reached the same conclusion. For example, the first century Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria realized that Genesis 1 was not a chronological account, and the fifth century church father and doctor of the church, St. Augustine, arrived at the same conclusion. What does the Catholic Church have to say about this today? It's supportive of this conclusion. According to paragraph 337 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, God himself created the visible world in all its richness, diversity, and order. Scripture presents the work of the Creator symbolically as a succession of six days of divine work concluded by the rest of the seventh day. So the Catechism concludes that Genesis depicts the work of the Creator symbolically as a succession of six days, meaning that the text really does tell us what the Creator did, but not in a way that gives us a literal chronology. That means that, as far as the Church is concerned, the sources of faith do not require us to hold that the world was literally created in a six-day period just a few thousand years ago. It could be much older or even younger But since the sources of faith don't determine the issue, that's a matter for science to explore. We'll therefore need to look further into the scientific evidence, which we'll be covering next episode. What's the Church's attitude toward the science that's been done on this question? According to paragraph 283 of the Catechism, 
The question about the origins of the world and of man has been the subject of many scientific studies, which have splendidly enriched our knowledge of the age and dimensions of the cosmos, the development of life forms, and the appearance of man. These discoveries invite us to even greater admiration for the greatness of the Creator, prompting us to give Him thanks for all His works and for the understanding and wisdom He gives to scholars and researchers. In saying this, the Catechism is thinking of the studies that are part of mainstream science. It's not thinking of studies done by Henry Morris's Institute for Creation Research or similar groups. So the Church is supportive of the mainstream scientific account according to which the universe and the earth are billions of years old and life forms developed gradually under God's care. Does that mean that Catholics are obliged to accept the mainstream scientific account? No, and this is something I want to make really clear. What the Church has done is examine the sources of faith and conclude they don't prevent the mainstream scientific account from being true. It's also expressed appreciation for the work mainstream scientists have done, but neither of those things amounts to a teaching that the universe is billions of years old or that evolution has happened. Those are matters of science, not doctrine, not faith. So it's up to science to prove them or not. In fact, for the church to issue a doctrinally binding teaching on these matters, I mean, to make them a matter of doctrine rather than science, you need to show from the Bible or the church fathers that we're obliged to believe that the world is old and that evolution happened. And I don't know how you'd begin to go about doing that. So these are just matters of science. And if you think the scientific evidence points to a young earth or away from evolution happening, you're perfectly free to believe those things. You are not a bad Catholic or a bad Christian. There is room for those opinions. And I want to make that clear. However, one also should recognize that the church has ruled that the sources of faith don't demand a young earth or that evolution didn't happen. And so evolution and an old earth are also legitimate opinions, and nobody is a bad Catholic or a bad Christian for accepting those either. Some Catholic young earth supporters don't like that the magisterium has made the judgments it has and try to argue that the sources of faith or church teaching does require belief in a young earth, but they are not accurately or honestly representing what the church has had to say about this. They're taking their preferred answers and projecting them onto what the church has to say in documents like the catechism. So, Jimmy, what is your preliminary bottom line for the first part of our discussion of the young earth? My bottom line for now is that the church has ruled that the sources of faith don't rule out the idea of an old earth. So we'll need to turn to the scientific evidence next. All right. So before we get to that in our next episode, what further resources do we have to offer to the listener? We'll have a link to Adrian Mayer's book, The First Fossil Hunters, Dinosaurs, Mammoths, and Myth in Greek and Roman Times. It's a really great book about how people have been finding dinosaur bones all through history and how that's influenced dragon legends and other mythologies. We'll also have a link to Sam Keen's book on the elements of the periodic table. The book is called The Disappearing Spoon, and it's a really fun read. We'll have a link to the video of the dinosaurs at the Mother Goose Parade back in 2016, which was a lot of fun. Also, buddy, a video of Buddy Davis's song, D is for Dinosaur, and a place where you can purchase D is for Dinosaur and other creation-themed music by Buddy Davis online in MP3 form. We'll have links to the Institute for Creation Research, the Creation and Earth History Museum here in Santee, also articles on radiometric dating and radiocarbon dating specifically, a link to the Anno Mundi system, which is the, the age of the world calculations according to traditional things. Anno Mundi just means the year of the world in Latin, including the Byzantine calculation, the Hebrew calculation, and the Archbishop Usher calculation. We'll also have links to the two paragraphs in the catechism we quoted, and that should give people a running start. Excellent. 
So uh, let's uh, at this point turn to our mysterious feedback that we've received from listeners. Uh, this feedback comes from our episode on the desperate coup in Japan at the end of World War II. Uh, the first feedback comes from Boware PL on YouTube, who writes, I would love to watch an anime of that. It would be fascinating to see an anime of the Kyujo incident. I don't know. There have been movies made of it. I don't know of an anime that's been made of it, but I can offer you the next best thing or something close to it anyway. And that comes from Timothy Meeting, who sends an email who says, Thank you for your podcasts. I discovered them this summer and have devoured 43 episodes and am spreading the word. Regarding episode 113, I believe another worthwhile resource for your listeners would be the manga Showa, A History of Japan by Shigeru Mizuki. It is extensive and addresses Japan's militarism, including the coups you address, as well as more about Emperor Hirohito's participation in the war effort, which is more involved than what you report. However, it didn't mention the 1945 coup, to the best of my memory. And so we'll also have a link to the Showa manga. Uh, and for people who may not be aware, mangas are basically a type of Japanese comic or comic book. They're often very serious. They can be very serious and tackle very serious issues. So don't think, you know, a campy type comic book. These can be serious. And in fact, the manga Showa, Showa being the name of Emperor Hirohito, in retrospect, this manga has won multiple awards in Japan and in the United States, where it won an Eisner Award. And if you know anything about American comics, Will Eisner is one of the great American artists and writers for comics, and the award given in his name is very prestigious. So if you win an Eisner, that's very significant. All right. Uh, Aaron Wood writes on YouTube, I don't think this really counts as a mystery, but it's still a cool story. Uh, as Thomas Aquinas would say, we need to make a distinction between different sense of the terms mystery. It may not be a mystery to us today because we have the records, but it would have been mysterious to people at the time. It certainly what was going on behind the scenes in Japan was certainly a mystery to the American forces. And it was even a mystery to a lot of people in Japan because you had the coup plotters doing stuff in secret. I mean, the emperor didn't know about this until some point. And so... Uh, it's close enough to a mystery or a mystery in enough of a sense that I I wanted to cover it here. Also, because you're right, it's just a cool story. It was a mystery to me. I had never heard about it, so it was a mystery until I'd heard about it. Uh, Suzanne writes on Facebook, this was a really good episode. I just finished reading American Caesar, the biography of MacArthur, and this shed light on what was happening on the other side of things during the surrender. And that's that's true that you're highlighting from MacArthur's perspective, you know, he get this gets this message from the Japanese saying, hey, please delay this thing by a couple of days because of internal issues. And it's like, OK, what are those internal issues that you're not telling me? Mm. Uh, then Genia writes on Facebook, I'm so excited to incorporate it into my U.S. history class. That's awesome. I've had messages from other people who teach classes uh, that they find the material on Mysterious World helpful. And so that's really great that it's being incorporated and having an influence on what people are learning out there. Yes. So that's all the feedback I have. Uh, Jimmy, do you have some more? Yeah, well, two things. The first one is I wanted to say thank you to you, Dom, because uh, you posted, you found at the Naval National Naval Aviation Museum pictures of the Betty Bombers. That was the American nickname of the type of Japanese plane that took the officials to uh, Manila to arrange the surrender documents that we talked about and the dramatic story of how that happened and how they, like, sprang a leak and had to ditch on their way back. And so you found uh, pictures of those planes and and the people right. who traveled on them, and you posted them on Facebook, and we'll have a link to the National Naval Aviation Museum pictures of them so you can see them. So wanted to thank you for that. You're welcome. Also, I wanted to say a special thanks to a listener from Germany named Richard Stosch, if I'm saying it correctly. Uh, please forgive me if I'm not. 
he was one of several listeners who responded to the request we made in the Thomas Aquinas in the Occult episodes of did people know of sources that could help get us closer to the original Latin for some of the miraculous events that were reported in Aquinas's life and some of the things he actually said. And it's kind of difficult to find that kind of material because most of the books on Aquinas deal with his writings rather than primary sources for his biographies. And we had several people who made some recommendations, but Richard actually went and found online the Fontes Vitae Sancti Tome Aquinatus, the sources for the life of St. Thomas Aquinas in Latin, including things of like his canonization process. And he went through them and he was able to get uh, some additional information on two of the points we raised. First, there uh, was a question about did, after his apparent mystical experience, did Aquinas say that his writing seemed like straw to him? Well, there are a couple of different accounts, but translating them from the Latin, as Richard has done for us, in the first account, Aquinas told one of his colleagues, the end of my writing has come because such things have been revealed to me that the things that I have written and taught seem insignificant to me. There's a second account where he's talking to one of his companions, and he's alleged to have said, Reynaldus, I can't because all of the things I have written seem to me like chaff. And he uses the Latin word palie, which would mean not straw particularly, but literally chaff or husks, so like the cast off part of the wheat. He also was able to get uh, more information about the reports of Aquinas levitating because the ones I had found just said he was lifted up, but it wasn't clear. Did that, does that just mean ecstasy? You know, he's lifted up mentally or spiritually, but not physically. Well, according to Richard's uh, research in the sources, he found three incidents of levitation being reported. Two of them are said to have occurred in such a way that Aquinas was elevated about two cubits off the ground. So that would be about three feet off the ground or about a meter. In the third incident, so it's not just one incident, but three different incidents. In the third incident, he is said to have been levitated about a cubit in the air. So that would be about 18 inches or about half a meter. However, this is Richard writing. He says, however, I did not find a single mention of an elevation miracle in the interrogation protocols of his canonization process. It seems very strange to me that not a single one of all the questioned witnesses reported such an incident. So maybe the witnesses that could have reported such an event were not interrogated, or these miracles are, after all, very early pious inventions of Thomas's early biographers. All right. Very good. Thank you to, to very scholarly listeners sending in feedback. That's awesome. Yeah. So, Jimmy, uh, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? A couple things. So both of which hark back to previous headlines we've had. We've mentioned before Oumuamua, which was a strange object that plunged through our solar system Last year, it was clearly from outside the solar system. It was the first extrasolar object that we'd actually witnessed coming through the solar system. And there was a question when it went around the sun, it moved in a very strange way that led some people to suggest it might be some scientists to suggest it might be an alien craft. Well, then some other scientists said, nah, it's not aliens. But now some scientists are rethinking that. They've looked at the alternative proposals of, of what might explain the way it moved and said, eh, not so quick. This isn't as easily explainable as, as has been proposed. Maybe it was an alien craft after all. So you can read about that. Also, in a previous feedback se or a previous headline segment, we told you about glacier mice, which are... Uh, little sort of round green plants that migrate over glaciers in a way that scientists don't fully understand. And this time we have a headline about another kind of strange round green plant thing. I've actually been aware of these for years, but I was delighted to run across this link. They're called Marimo. 
and they are Japanese algae ball water pet things. <laughs> they live in water. And you can grow them in your aquarium, and they can get really big. But I've often thought they're so cool. I mean, they're just like these perfectly round, soft, green ball things. They look really cool, and I want one, but I haven't got I haven't gotten one yet. <laughs> okay, but you can read about them and see pictures. Awesome. All right, I think that's it from us. So what did, we want to hear from you, the listener. What are your theories about what the faith perspective has to say on the idea of a young earth? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next episode, we'll start looking at what the scientific evidence has to say about a young Earth. Very good. Folks, be sure to share the podcast with your friends uh, and write a review uh, in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from to help us grow our community and continue to reach more and more listeners. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to those mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Hey, D is for dinosaur, but it's a brand new word. Invented in 1841, it means terrible lizard. Spell D. Are found in rocks made of sand.